All right, this morning, um, before we get started, we're going to be continuing our journey through uh, the story of the woman um, at the well and speaking about um, the importance of sharing our faith. And I have said now multiple times uh, the verse that's the foundation for uh, what we're trying to focus on as we go through this section. Jesus said, follow me and I will do what? I'll make you fishers of men. And so uh, a long time ago, the Lord gave me um, a fishing song about this passage, okay? And it's just a silly song about the need for us to go fish, all right? Jesus said, I'll make you fishers of men. But oftentimes I find it hard to begin to climb into the boat with my tackle in hand and push off from the comfy shore. We must be faithful to feed the fish so they know what they're hungry for. You can't catch if you don't cast, and they won't bite if you don't bait. And we must live our lives in such a way as to lure them to the cross. So throw Christ's lifeline out to them, and let God's word do its work. Cause when they swallow his hook, you will land them in life. And Christ said, you can't control the fish. No, I'm not in charge of making them bite. All I need do is trust in his power and take it out for a spin. And let his love lure and feel as the Spirit reels them in. No, you can't catch if you don't cast. And they won't bite if you don't pay. And we must live our lives in such a way as to lure them to the cross. So throw Christ's lifeline out to them And let God's word do its work Cause when they swallow his hook He'll land them in life Yes, when they swallow his hook He'll land them in life All right, with that, open up uh, the Bible to the Gospel of John, chapter 4, and we'll get started. John, chapter 4. So as we've gone through the Gospel of John, we've been specifically here in chapter 4 focusing on this idea of the need for us to share our faith in Jesus Christ. And before we get started this morning, I want to encourage you to stop for just a second. Uh, maybe close your eyes because that removes some distractions. So if you could just close your eyes. I would like for you to think of uh, somebody in your life that does not yet know Christ that you you have the opportunity to share Jesus with. Go ahead and think of somebody. Great. Now, with that being said, I want you to keep that in mind as we uh, go throughout our time together today. And it's my hope that the Lord would burden our hearts for sharing our faith with other people. Again, we're going to finish out our journey here with the woman at the well. Let me cover some of the brief uh, points with you up to this point in, in the story. First of all, again, the Bible says that God has called every believer in Jesus Christ to be a fisher of men. It's only a question of whether or not we fish. Um, we see this now with Jesus. He's going to demonstrate that for us with the woman at the well in the sense that he had to pass through Samaria. He was on a mission to meet this woman one day by the well. 
Uh, she shows up, she's cut off or an outcast from society. And so much of the time, uh, God does not ask you and me to be the judge of who should hear or who should not hear. We're supposed to share his message with everybody, including outcasts. Often, when we try to share our faith, uh, there's differences in cultures, right, that can initially be obstacles like happened with the Samaritan woman. But Jesus initiated the conversation with her anyway. And God is calling you and me to initiate the conversation with people, whether it's awkward or not. When we initiate the conversation, it's great to pray in advance and ask God to show us and reveal to us along the way connecting points between their story and our story. Jesus uses the common, uh, common issue with this woman of her need for water. Uh, but she shows up and she's wounded and she's pretty crusty with her answers, right? Uh, it doesn't go really well uh, at the start of the conversation. And she starts to make excuses and challenge Jesus. But Jesus uh, takes the time to clarify her questions and answer her questions. Just because she's salty about it doesn't mean Jesus goes, oh, I'm so sorry. Excuse me, right, for bringing it up. I won't talk to you about me ever again. That he doesn't do that. And thank God he doesn't do that with us. Also, with the woman, when she reaches a place where she's interested in having the living water that Jesus is offering to her, she basically is wanting to use it just to make her life more comfortable. And oftentimes when people come to uh, place their faith in Christ, initially when they walk through the door, they're just looking for comfort maybe, right? But Jesus, just because she's asking maybe for superficial reasons, doesn't uh, give up on her. And he begins to convict her of her sin in her life, knowing that, hey, until we come to a realization of our need for Jesus, we can't come to that realization until we're willing to realize our own need for Christ. Conviction must, our sin must be addressed. And ultimately, when it's convicted, when we're convicted, we're led by the power of the Holy Spirit to confess our sin, but for a specific reason, so we can be cleansed from our sin, washed white as snow. We uh, read about it again in Psalm 103 today. In one of the verses we talked about it was, God has removed our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. I mean, total, totally cleansed from our sin. Um, <clears throat> then the lady, she kind of comes up with her normal cover story. And unbelievers tend to resort to their own standard excuse also, uh, most people who have not yet placed their faith in Christ due to the way we're raised, due to the way this world works, are convinced that they have to do some good thing. What good thing must I do? Right? And she's still sort of stuck in this place. And Jesus takes the time. Uh, she's confused also about the differences in religions, right? She's confused about, well, what's the difference between Samaritans and Jews? And Jesus takes the time to clarify uh, the difference between religion and relationship with her. And finally, also, most people are convinced um, that they need to, again, do good works to earn God's love. But Jesus takes the time to correct her for her misunderstanding. And finally, we see that Jesus doesn't quit on her. Don't let a little discouragement uh, force you to stop. We need to be about God's business. Jesus said, follow me, and what is he going to do? He'll make you a fisher of men. Okay, It's a done deal. Uh, you don't catch fish every time you catch. And then last of all, we finished out last week uh, discussing how um, Jesus is not interested in being snuck in the back door. He's ready to come through the front door. And uh, we don't need to cloak and dagger uh, issues with Jesus. Rather, we need to speak about him openly. So with that... Um, <clears throat> look at John chapter 4, verse 25. We'll read the last two verses we hung up on uh, last week. The woman said to him, to Jesus, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ, and when he comes, he'll tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who's speaking with you. So Jesus reveals himself to her. Now, here's what I want you to think about today. Jesus has now demonstrated for us our need. He, he gives us the example of how we're supposed to be sharing our faith, okay? And he's inviting us to follow him, to follow his lead. Jesus said, okay, this is what I want you to do. Now go do it. And that's what's so great about this story with the Samaritan woman. She has an encounter with Christ. She places her faith in Jesus as her Messiah and immediately... 
she starts to imitate everything Jesus just did for her with other people. And so we're going to be spending some time um, looking at that today. If you want to watch um, an interesting portrayal of how this story could have played out, uh, The Chosen is not the Bible. I'm not saying it's the Bible on film, but it is really interesting and it is thought-provoking. If you want to watch um, any of these uh, series, this new series that's out about the life of Christ and his ministry, um, the end of season one and the start of season two is all about uh, the, the woman at the well and what transpires. Uh, the end of season one is what transpires at the well. The woman goes off to fish. And then uh, season two starts with uh, the woman at the well and what she does and where we'll pick it up today. So verse 27, John chapter four. Remember, Jesus has been at the well all by himself up until now with the woman. Just then his disciples came back and they marveled that Jesus was talking with the woman. But no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking to her? Now, if you're going to go out and share your faith in Christ, sometimes your friends and your family might not understand what in the world you're doing. They might think you're a little bit nuts or a little bit touched. Not everybody's also going to believe either. Just because you share, not everybody's going to be, whoopee, give me Jesus, okay? Some people will reject it. Some people won't. But don't let the lack of people's comprehension to prevent you from sharing your faith. I want to encourage you, share your faith in Jesus Christ anyway. You're not responsible for making anybody believe. We're only responsible to share. That's it. Okay, verse 28. So the woman left her water jar and she went into town and she said to the people, <clears throat> come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? And they went out of town and they were coming to him. Now, after this woman <clears throat> receives her first taste of living water, what Jesus offers her, she leaves Jacob's well behind. Why? Because she had encountered someone much more satisfying. The well of Jesus and living water that he offers is far more glorious than Jacob's well ever could be. Okay, And it says she leaves her water jar. She's on her way to the well. She has an encounter with Jesus. She leaves her water jar and now she turns around and goes the opposite direction. And it reminded me that uh, we have to turn the corner in our place uh, in our faith with Christ. Right At some point, we have to repent. We have to turn around. We see this woman demonstrating this idea of turning around right here. The word repentance simply means a 180 degree corner. Like uh, I was going this way and I'm not going that way anymore. Now I'm going to uh, go another way, a new way. Also, as a brand new believer and a disciple of Christ, what did she do? Literally, immediately, she went and went fishing. She fished for men. Some translations of the Bible say specifically that's who uh, she went to talk to in town was the men. Other uh, translations say it's, it's for everybody. But regardless, I was thinking about it. Why, if she did just go initially talk to the men, uh, why do you think she did that? Well, because men is all she knew. Remember this woman's story? How many different men has she had for husbands? Five. She's living with another guy who's not her husband. So she goes back to the people that she has been living in sin with and she starts to say, do what? Hey, come and see a man. Come and see a man who's told me everything I've ever done. Come and see. She went straight away. As soon as she's had an encounter with Christ, man, she is out and she goes fishing right away. Now, also, we see her, she's inviting and she's saying, hey, come, come and see a man. Now, the thing that I want to encourage us to think about, first of all, is when you're inviting people to come to a place of faith in Jesus Christ, um, yes, you can say, hey, come with me to church. That's great. But church is not the, the thing. Or come and, and watch this thing with me where you know they're going to hear about Jesus. That's not the thing. Ultimately, who, who do we need to lead people to? To a place or a program? No, it's to a person. It's Jesus. This lady says, come see a man. Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. She takes the time to extend the invitation and she extends it to the whole community. Are we extending 
Um, invitations. Are we inviting people to come to Christ? Next, she communicates, right? She shares her story. Her story of her encounter with Jesus. Listen, if you want to have a huge impact in the lives of other people, do you want to know what will make a huge impact? When you simply tell them why you believe in Jesus. Tell them your story. Tell them why you have placed your faith in Christ. What it is about Jesus that saved you, redeemed you. Tell them your story. That's what this woman simply did. Now, to communicate and the importance of communication in this whole process, the Apostle Paul uh, speaks about it at length. But in Romans chapter 10, verses 14 through 15, Paul writes and says this about the need for us to go fish. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching, without somebody communicating? How are they ever supposed to hear? If you don't take the time to communicate, will they hear? Will they know? No, you need to open your mouth and communicate. Also, he says, regarding what we're communicating, he says, how are they to preach unless they are sent? How are they to preach unless they were sent? Jesus said, again, follow me and I will what? Say it again. Follow me and I will what? So what has he sent us to do? To fish. To go fish for men. To be faithful to share the message of Jesus Christ with people who do not yet know. That's what he's called you to do. How... How are they to preach unless they're sent? Then this is what Jesus says about those who are sent. You're sent, I'm sent. Okay, we've solved that. As it's written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Who preach the good news. Listen, when you're out sharing your faith in Jesus Christ, you're coaxing them to come to Christ. You don't need to coerce them. We need to remember that it's good news. You are sharing gospel. The word gospel means good news, not bad news, not bummer news, right? It's good news. So how do you get fish in the boat? How do I, if I'm out fishing and I want to get a fish in my boat, do I jump in the water and try to, you know, coerce it into the boat? No, I coax it, right? I lure it. I fish, right? We don't need to coerce people. Also, another thing, I've thought about it before because it would be nice if it worked, but it doesn't. I've thought a lot of times that sledgehammer ministries would be great, right? If you could hit somebody hard enough upside the head where they had an awakening and they just stay stuck to Jesus, that'd be great. But it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. We have to coax them to Christ, okay? Now, verse uh, 31. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you don't know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Now, remember, first of all, the disciples, if you know the story, they originally left Jesus alone at the well to go into town to do what? To get some food. Okay, they're coming back now with the food. They're physically hungry. They also knew that their rabbi needed refreshment. So naturally, they encouraged him, hey, eat something. And the disciples are such great examples in the Bible for us of God's grace and God's patience. Just because they don't get it, just because they don't understand, do you ever find Jesus saying, okay, that is enough. Three strikes and you're out, right? That, I am sick to death of you not understanding what I'm trying to communicate. Is that what happens? No, Jesus doesn't give up on them because they don't understand. They were always dealing with the practical and logical issues while Jesus was trying to make them think about eternal matters. Now, Jesus said, I have food to eat that you don't know about. And I got to thinking about it. Man, I like comfort food. I like comfort cuisine. Man, you you eat something. Is there a specific sort of something that you like to eat? And you sit down, you're like, ooh. That's the business right there. That's good stuff, right? I won't get too sidetracked. But anyway, sharing sharing Jesus, it has been my experience over and over and over again. In fact, just this week, I had it again. Sharing Jesus with somebody else is deeply satisfying. 
Jesus is saying, hey, I, I'm satisfied. And I don't know if you've ever taken the time to share your faith with somebody and you've had that person respond positively and receive Christ in their life and seek to follow the Lord. But if you never have, God's inviting you to do it. He wants you to do that. He wants you to be about that business. And you'll discover that when somebody actually responds, oh, it's deeply satisfying. Because you're fulfilling your purpose. And you're like, man, that's, that's good. That was really good. Just this week um, at our junior high, our middle school campus life on Tuesday, I gave students an opportunity to respond to Jesus. And nobody did at the time um, that evening when we, when we wrapped up. But I had students fill out some cards asking if they wanted some more info. And I called one of those students on my way home. His name is David. And throughout the course of the conversation, he said, you know, I really do want to invite Jesus into my life. And so he's an eighth grader, and I was talking with him on the phone between Malin and Klamath, and between there, David decided over the phone that he wanted to commit his life to Jesus Christ, and he invited Christ into his life, and I can tell you, it was deeply satisfying. Would that have happened if I didn't ask him? Probably not. God wants to be at work through us, and he can work through different people, but he wants to be at work through us to do those things. Now, imagine how enjoyable it must have been. Jesus is saying he's satisfied. For Jesus to share the truth with people, and they actually believed him. Is that what happens with Jesus' story a lot, if you're familiar? (laughs) No, right? He didn't need to perform in this particular area. Jesus doesn't perform this really interesting His entire time in Samaria, he never performs a single miracle, not one. All he does is just talk, he shares the truth with them, and people believe. Can you imagine how rewarding that must have felt for Christ? Notice also, is the crowd he's talking to Jewish or Samaritan? There's no Jews there except the disciples and himself, right? They were outcasts, but the outcasts were what? They were hungry for Jesus. We're going to see it in just a second. Now, later on, when we continue our journey here through John, as soon as Jesus leaves Samaria and goes back to the Jews, he receives a completely different reaction. But are we faithful to lead other people to the truth of Christ? If we do, we'll find it extremely satisfying. Verse 34, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. What's Jesus' purpose? To be about his father's business. What do you think should be our purpose? Yeah, fish, right? Be about the father's business. Be about the father's business. May we get our sustenance, our hunger. Jesus says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. May we get our sustenance, our hunger, filled by doing the will of our Father God. Boy, that'd be good. Um, As his disciples, again, what has Jesus called us to do? I think I have uh, Caitlin. Can you read Matthew 4.19 for us, please? Yeah, I think that's what I had you give. Perfect. Come follow me. Come follow me, and you'll what? You'll what? You're going to fish for men. If you're following him, you better be fishing, right? You better be fishing. Now, verse 35. Uh, then Jesus. <clears throat> This is cool. Jesus is going to start talking about the harvest. Uh, Verse 35, don't say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest. Jesus asks them to alter their perspective. He says, look, I tell you, lift up your eyes. Who knows if they were just probably, you know, looking down at the ground when he's talking to him. He says, lift up your eyes 
and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who, is re- who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. Jesus is compelling you and me to get out there and start harvesting. He's saying, hey, it's ready. Stop waiting around. There's nothing to wait for. Go. Start harvesting. Enter into the harvest. Jesus also may have been pointing when he asked them to lift up your eyes and look. He may have been pointing to the townspeople because we know here as the story unfolds that the entire town starts coming out to see Jesus at this well. So Jesus could have been seeing and referencing this crowd of people that were coming. And it's interesting because at certain um, seasons, the Samaritans still today and in the past wear white turbans on their heads. And maybe Jesus is referencing this crowd of men, this crowd of people that are coming to them wearing these white turbans. And he says, hey, look. The fields are white for harvest. Look at all these people coming. We are to be harvesting the field of humanity surrounding us. The time is now. The time is not later. It's not even tomorrow. Harvesting is fun too. I know that for dad, when we were growing up, his favorite time of the year was potato harvest. He loved, all the rest of the farming was good, but potato harvest was great. He loved harvesting um, things from the ground right that he had planted. And listen, harvesting is a blast. It's great. It's great to see people uh, come to a place of faith in Christ. Now, Paul's writing and he says, whether we plant or reap, seeing the end result is always a time of rejoicing. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5-9, through 9, Paul's writing about different people who are about the ministry of Jesus. And he says, what then is Apollos, this guy who's serving Christ? What is Paul? Servants, through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his wages according to his labor. We're God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. And Paul is saying, listen, who cares? Who cares? If you, if you share your faith in Jesus Christ, and somebody is not interested at that point in time in responding to Jesus Christ, have you done them a disservice or a service anyway? Regardless of what they believe, have you done them a service or a disservice? You've done them a big favor, man. You've just talked to them about good news. Are you responsible for anything that they do with it? Does the Bible, do you find one single verse in the Bible where God says, oh, hey, you need to go out and make people believe? Is there one verse in the Bible that says that? No, there isn't. All God says is just share, just share. Whether you plant, whether you reap, it doesn't matter. Just go fish for heaven's sakes. Just fish. Okay, uh, I asked, I think it, I forgot who it was, but 2 Corinthians 9.6, I think it's Joel. 2 Corinthians 9.6. Remember this, the farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. All right, would you like to see a lot of people come to faith in Jesus Christ like you have come to faith in Jesus Christ? Then according to God's word, go fish a lot. He who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who sows uh, bountifully will also reap bountifully, right? If you want to see a bunch of people come to faith in Jesus Christ, then share your faith. Share your faith with people. Give them the opportunity, If you sow sparingly, well, don't sit around and wonder like, well, I wonder why nobody ever, wonder why I've never led anybody to faith in the Lord. Well, chances are you're not sharing anything. Now, there's no need also to hope. You're not going like, oh, when you're out there and you're going to go out and you're going to share your faith in Christ. You're not going out there uh, and hoping Somehow, oh gosh, I hope, I hope it's harvest time. No, it's not. It is harvest time. You don't have to wonder. It is harvest time. The real need is for laborers, disciples, fishers of men who are willing to simply harvest. Lizzie, would you read Matthew 9? Uh, this is the word of Jesus. Matthew 9, 37 through 38. He said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his fields. 
Is it harvest time or not? Yes. A slam dunk. It's harvest time. Just go do it. Put your combine out in the field and start it up and get after it. Put your lure in the water and get after it. What if other people, let's again, let's flip the table around. What if somebody else looked at your life or my life and said, oh, you know, they probably won't believe I don't want to put my, I don't want to force what I think on that other person. What if they'd have done that for you? Aren't you glad somebody shared with you? If it was your parents, aren't you glad your parents shared with you? If it was your neighbor, aren't you glad your neighbor shared with you? If it was a coworker, aren't you glad your coworker shared with you? Then go share. This woman. She sees Jesus do it. She's convinced. She starts fishing. Okay? We need to be fishing for men. And, the, and Jesus doesn't say it's an issue with the harvest being ready. What's the problem, according to Jesus? Yeah. How, what are we supposed to do to fix it then? He gives us a, a place to start. Pray earnestly for the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And I can tell you his answer to that prayer. When you pray and you ask, oh Lord, we need more people uh, to be out here harvesting in, in your field. You want to know what the Lord's answer to that prayer is? It's already yes. You don't ask that. And then God say, nope, I'm, I'm burnt out, man. We just don't have any more equipment to get in the field there to harvest with. I don't know what to do. No, he's going to say yes. And you want to know what else he's going to say? When you pray and you say, Lord, we need more people. He's going to say, all right, let's start with who? You. you. Let's start with you. Great idea. Let's start with you. Now, verse 39, or 37 rather. Um, here it says, Jesus continues, the saying holds true. One sows, another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you've entered into that labor. Now, you never know when, when I'm sharing Christ with other people or maybe you've had the opportunity to share Christ with other people. Um, sometimes you're the, you're the last person in line and it's harvest time, right? I mean, other people have sown and planted and you kind of enter in and you're, you're at the very end and, and you get the blessing of receiving, right? But it doesn't matter what, what portion of this process you're in, just fish, just share, and if the people are ready uh, to bite, right? If they're ready, if they're hungry for the Lord, then great. If they're not, that's okay. So what? You fish. That's all Jesus asked you to do. Yeah, you, tried. you tried. Okay? And you keep trying, right? Just you, like you keep casting. You don't just go, well, I don't know. A person wasn't initial. They weren't interested initially, so I quit. No, you keep fishing. Okay? Now, verse uh, 39. Many Samaritans from that town believed in Jesus. It doesn't say all, by the way. It just says many. Because of the woman's testimony, he told me all I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked Jesus to stay with them. And he stayed there two days and many more believed because of what? Because of his word, right? Now, again, personal testimonies um, and stories of, of salvation for ourselves are powerful tools when we're sharing our faith. Initially, these people come out to Jesus. Why? Why do they come? Curious. They're curious. Why? Because she said, she said her story, right? Come see. So they take her invitation. However, her words uh, don't cause a revival. It's Jesus. It's Jesus' words. Right? They show up and many more believe because of his word. And listen, in the Bible, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, God's word is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It even judges the thoughts and the intentions of our hearts. How important is it when you go fishing to bring, to bring this along? How important is it to reference the word of God? It's extremely important. Now, the woman said, come, and guess what? They came. She called, come, 
and they came. Now, in James chapter 4, verse 2, Jesus, uh, James is Jesus' half-brother, and he didn't believe in Jesus when Jesus was alive all the way through until probably sometime after his resurrection. But he does come to faith in Christ, and he does write a book in the Bible, and it's all up in your business. If you've never read the book of James, if you want to get a nice slap in the face, go, go read the book of James. But James chapter 4, verse 2, James is speaking about prayer. And James says this in James chapter 4, verse 2, You have not because you ask not. You have not because you ask not. Jesus said the harvest is ripe. Are there plenty of hungry fish out there or not, according to Jesus? Oh, you bet your sweet bippy. There's a bunch. There is a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of people who are hungry for Jesus. Who's going to go fishing? Okay? <clears throat> I was thinking about it. Also, it's not a shortage of fish. It's a shorter, shortage of fishermen, right? We have not because we ask not. I was thinking about the, the card game Go Fish, right? Uh, to win the game, right, you've got to make books of four, right? And you have to uh, find out, hey, who's got, you got any fours, you ask? The person, you know, next in line. And if they have any, they have to give you some, right? And they give you some. Why? Because you asked, right? If you don't have any, they say no. And then they say to you what? Go fish. Keep fishing. Keep going. When your turn comes around again, you have another opportunity. You keep fishing. You got any eights? Go fish. Doesn't matter how many times you strike out. Just keep going. Now, Jesus is ready and he's waiting to do more than we can ask or imagine, especially when it comes to evangelism or discipleship. Uh, <clears throat> when you pray and you desire to want to begin or you're talking to the Lord and you're asking God, oh God, could I have a new car? My current car stinks. It's terrible. It breaks down all the time. Um, God may or may not send you a new car. Maybe you come to the Lord and you're like, Lord, I'm real sick. We've got serious sickness. Um, in our family. Would you please heal? Sometimes God heals. Praise God that he does. And sometimes he chooses not to. But regarding the issue of evangelism and discipleship, his answer to those prayers are yes, every single time. Every single time. He wants you to go do it. We don't have to wonder if Jesus wants to bring more people into relationship with him. His main purpose was to seek and save the lost. So we have not because we Ask not. Jesus himself commissioned all of his followers to do the following. In Matthew 28, 19, Jesus is talking. It's his last few words in Matthew before he takes off and ascends back to heaven. And Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Doesn't matter what creed you're from, what culture, of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to uh, observe all that I commanded you. And then how does Jesus sign off with the Great Commission? It's really cool. Jesus said, and lo, I'm with you always to the end of the age. So when I go get in the boat to go fish, when spiritually speaking, if you're going to go fishing, who wants to be in the boat with you? Who's in the boat with you? Jesus, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Do you think Jesus, if you're out there going to try to start sharing your faith with people, do you think Jesus is going to be sitting there inside your heart saying like, oh, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? You should be doing something else. Don't you know you could have ignored that person? Is that what he's going to say? No, Jesus is going to be in the boat and he's excited to fish. He lives in you and he wants to work through you. So that more people can come to faith in Christ. Now, how much does he want to work? Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Paul is writing about Jesus, about God and his desire to do amazing things. And it says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that you can ask or imagine. Now to him who's able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that you can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all, all generations forever and ever. Amen. Would you like to um, see God do the miraculous? 
I would hope so. Then go. Fish. You want to see God do some, some sort of revival in your family? You want to see God do some sort of revival in our community? You want to see God do some sort of miraculous thing here in our state, in our region, in wherever? Then go be about the business of Jesus Christ in this world that does not yet know Christ. The harvest is what? It's plentiful. The workers are few. Just go. Okay? Now... At the end of uh, John chapter 21, you can flip there if you want to, but there's a fun fishing story in there. It's a great story of God doing exceedingly abundantly. After the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Peter coaxed all the other disciples into going fishing again on the Sea of Galilee. Now, if you know the story, they fish all night, and how much do they catch? Nada, zip, zilch, nothing. Total strikeout. Then Jesus appears to them, from the shore, and he asked them if they had any success. Not knowing that it was Jesus, they responded, nope, we didn't get anything. And then, if you know the story, what Jesus said next was important. Jesus did not say, when Peter said, no, we fished all night, we caught nothing. Jesus did not say, oh, well, you tried. Better luck next time. You know, you probably suck. You're probably a bad fisherman. Just hang it up. I mean, you can't catch fish all night. What's the matter with you? You're terrible. Is that what Jesus tells them? No, he tells Jesus, keep fishing. Even at the worst time of the day, a time of the day doesn't even make any sense. They cast again on Jesus' command. They make an epic catch, one that's so big that John, who was a fisherman by trade, took the time because he wants his fishing story to tell how many fish were in the net. He was so shocked that it didn't break. 153. That's God doing exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we can ask or imagine. Now, again, regarding evangelism, regarding a spiritual harvest, we have not because we what? We ask not. Go fish. Okay? Verse 42. The last verse here. The woman said, they said to the woman, rather, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we've heard for ourselves and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Guess what your faith and my faith is supposed to be? Contagious. Our faith in Jesus Christ is supposed to be contagious. Our faith in Jesus should spread to other people. Not like COVID-19. They're not going to catch something terrible. It's the cure. Listen, I I go back to this all the time when I think about um, how crazy it is that we hang on to and we're stingy with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's like we're being stingy with the cure for cancer. We have something that is way more significant in this world than the cure for cancer. And we're... Well, I don't know if I want to interrupt that person's um, express elevator to hell. Maybe they should just burn and I'll, I'll be comfortable. Why even bother give them a warning? It's supposed to be contagious. Your love for Jesus Christ should be contagious. When people see that you love Jesus and that you're following Jesus, they should be like, what do you have and where do I get that? That looks really good. Also, notice uh, they say, hey, we've heard for ourselves and now we know that Jesus is what? What do they call Jesus? Even though they don't even, they're not even Jews, what do they call him? They call him the savior of what? Of the world. He's the savior of the world. That means he's the savior of anybody. He can be the savior of anybody. There's nobody, rich or poor, doesn't matter what color their skin is. It doesn't matter what culture they come from. It doesn't matter what language they speak. It doesn't matter whether they are um, well-dressed or whether they're scuzzy. It doesn't matter. Jesus is the savior of what? Praise God. Praise God, Jesus is the Savior of the world. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son so that whoever believes in Him won't perish but will have everlasting life. 
Next, finally, you notice that a lot of them believe. They're caught. Now, Jesus promised that some people, not everybody, but some people will believe. However, this is great news. He never said who would receive. He simply asked you to just fish. Just fish. Coax them to Christ, that they too might be saved. We're only responsible to cast. Jesus is responsible for the catch. Now, regarding fishing, and we're done. A good fisherman is diligent and patient, right? He doesn't quit just because nothing bites the first few minutes. He explores different areas along the shoreline. He uses different lures, different bait. He adjusts where his lure or his bait is running in the water. Is he going to run at high top or shallow anything to try to find a fish? He keeps casting until something glorious happens. Now, if you like to fish, I enjoy fishing. Um, Isaac is addicted to it. But, you know, if, if you get, when a fish hits the end of your line, is it fun or not? Oh, it's a lot of fun. It's big fun. Okay? Now, suddenly, when you keep casting, right, for a fisherman, unexpectedly, the boredom breaks because there's action at the end of the pole. There's interest at the end of the line. Now, sometimes a fish will swallow the whole hook on the first bite. Okay? And it's just, all you got to do is it's the fun of reeling them in. Sometimes, though, we have to practice patience. Have you ever been fishing and you can feel, if you've got a really good pole, and you can feel somebody down there going, they're interested, they're nibbling, right? You have to be patient. You have to wait. Sometimes it's a whopper, right, that you reel in. Other times it's just a young one. But ultimately, is it, is it possible to become a good fisherman if you never fish? Let me say that again. Is it possible... To become a good fisherman if you never fish? No. Go fish. Go fish. Go fish. Now, with that being said, I want you... Uh, We'll just do this for like a minute or less. I want you to turn to somebody next to you and I want you to visit or share with them the name of one or two people that you know that do not currently know Jesus. Somebody that you have a burden on your heart for. Go ahead and do that. We'll do that for just a few seconds. Visit with somebody next to you about somebody who does not yet know Christ. Good enough. Now, guess who, guess who God is calling to go share with that person that you just said? Yeah, get a mirror. Get a mirror. And yes, there you go. Get a mirror and look in it. You don't have to go far. Okay, to find that person. Now, Jesus said that the harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. Do what? To fix it. Pray. So, what we're going to do to just start that process before we dip out today is to just simply pray. And we're going to do just a popcorn time of prayer. I don't care if multiple people are talking at the same time, but I'm going to open it up and I'm just, we're going to bring names of people that you've mentioned. You don't have to say their last name if you don't want to, whatever. But we're just going to say their names out loud as a prayer to the Lord that God would begin to intervene in that person's life so that they can come to know Jesus. Okay, so that's how we're going to wrap up today. I'll get it started, and then you can just start saying the names of your folks. Uh, don't worry, God can hear. It doesn't matter if it sounds like chickens in a hen house. It's okay, because God, He's, he's big. He can handle uh, multiple people praying all over the world. Okay, so we don't got to worry about that. Let me pray. And then you can uh, start saying your names. 
Father, we right now, we acknowledge that in your word, you say that the harvest is plentiful. You say that the workers are few. You say to pray. So we do. Father, I just lift up Julian Perez to you. Isella. By the power of your Holy Spirit, O oh God, ignite in us a fire to just be about your business with the people that you have already placed in our lives. God, there is already fish just right there in the pond, right outside our front door. God, would you just be faithful to help us? You are faithful. God, help us to be faithful to you and do what you've asked us to do and to trust you that fishing is fun. And Lord, I pray that you would give us the courage to continue to keep casting, to not give up, to not quit. Lord, not everybody is going to bite. That's not our job, God. We've just, we're just supposed to be faithful to fish. So God, would you help us to do that in the lives of these people that we've lifted up to you even now? God, that they too might come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord, as their personal Savior, that their lives would be forever transformed by the power of God for your glory and for your sake. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. If I could get um, Jason and Jonathan to come up and help with, um, or Jason and Ryan. Let's get Jason and Ryan. Come up and help with um, communion, if you would. Casey, you can go ahead and uh, stop the live stream, if you would, for today.